Man, did I learn my lesson the hard way. Have you ever done that? You know, learned your lesson the hard way. <laughs> it was a tough one. It's still a tough one. I'm still recovering from the learning process, you could say, of just how hard it was for me to get this lesson taught me, I guess. About two weeks ago, my wife and I, well, about two months ago, my wife and I had been talking about going on vacation. We store up and save up, you know, and take the time to really go out camping for a week and to just veg out, you know, to do nothing except, you know, be alone, no computers, no responsibilities, no anything. We don't check the news, we don't check the internet, we don't check anything. We go to an area where there's no cell phone coverage. We enjoy it. Well, <coughs> my wife has been working at a job that has been increasingly changing its management and rearranging things that has caused more stress upon her. And she's able to handle the stress and she's able to do the job, but it's increased her workload and it's made it harder for her. And in some ways I think that maybe, and I'm not sure yet, you know, that God is moving her onward, you know, because she's he's moved a lot of other people out that were Christians. And usually that's a good sign that God is doing something. So anyways I've told her to start looking, you know, but a couple months ago, she's been there, oh, I don't know, about five years now. But a couple months ago, she started thinking about her vacation time, and we wanted to plan this out because she normally takes her vacation also in the winter to go spend with her time, her time with her kids in Utah, in uh, Salt Lake City, and to visit her grandchildren. And I don't go because I'm kind of like a kind of like that, you know, square peg, you know, in a round hole. Well, you know, I've gone to some of their weddings and I've gone to some of their events and I've gone to some of the children being born and, you know, I, for the most part, you know, prayed about, God, do you want me to witness or do you want my wife to witness? You know, do you want me to share anything? Do you want me to say anything? You know, it's like, well, no, Michael, just, you know, you, you just go. And so they all know I'm a Christian. They all have seen my website, I think, but I haven't said much to them, you know, and, I've let them have their peace, so to speak. But with my wife, you know, it's like her choice to share with them and to either be responsible to at least letting them know the gospel or to, you know, do as God leads her, whatever that may be. Now, I pray for them and she prays for them. and I just don't spend my time at certain seasons when I know I'm not at my best, especially Christmas. I'm really a downer. But... Um, she goes and spends time with the children, you know, and they play and they do all their things, you know. So, anyways, for me and her, though, our vacation time was being planned out, you know. And so, she told me all these different scenarios about how somebody at her job was taking this month for a vacation or taking that week, and then somebody else was pregnant, somebody else was doing this, and somebody else was doing that, and that she felt like she didn't want to make the business suffer by her being gone because she does so much work that she planned out to have a vacation like early rather than later in the summer. And so, you know, I kind of listened and I, I kind of sort of prayed about it. I didn't really spend much time in prayer. I just kind of planned it out, you know, because I always lay out my plans before the Lord. And so we, I kind of accommodated her. You know, I kind of said, well, you know, maybe that's a good idea. And so I started throwing out these dates, you know, and kind of looking at, you know, early July and, you know, early June, really, because, you know, we didn't want to be gone for, you know, the state fair that we can, you know, go every night and hear, go dancing, basically, because that's all we really do is go dancing. We don't go to the shops and stuff. Can't afford it. You know, in the water park, you know, we go to the water park on weekends, you know, so we have our own little routines that we can do. But... This vacation had become such a big deal that, you know, because we had so much fun last year, we wanted to repeat having the same kind of fun, you know, just 
quiet, doing nothing. Everything going to be hunky-dory and fine. Well, God had other plans. <laughs> as we planned out this, I accommodated her and then as we planned out, you know, we had all these plants that were growing and vegetables and a garden going and you know, all this stuff was pretty much in the way of our timing. And I thought, well, you know, if 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 one or two plants survive fine, you know, but I'll just set it up so that you know, it'll be easier for somebody to come over and water them for us, you know, because we'll be gone a week and there was going to be 100 degree weather here. So I thought, wow, it's a good time to get out. So I took the house apart to make it easier for this person to water. I accommodated her so that I could accommodate my wife and we could accommodate her business in order to plan out our vacation. Are you getting the idea about accommodating yet? Accommodations? That's the name of this tape. Well, again, it was good in some ways. It was bad in other ways. And in some ways, it was just downright a learning lesson. So, <coughs> as we got closer to the date we were going to leave, we had no real monies to go. We we're waiting for our income tax to come in and it just wouldn't come in. It just didn't come in, didn't come in, didn't come in, didn't come in. And we didn't really save up enough money to go on vacation. But we accommodated ourselves to because we had planned this out. We were going to go anyways. And so kind of got shoved into the idea. And then as we got closer, we wanted to, you know, make our car get fixed before the vacation. So right at the last minute, we got our car fixed. Well, that was good. That was nice and the Lord blessed us in that, but it cost twice as much as it was supposed to. So we didn't have the money. We had to borrow the money actually to take care of the car. Well, as I began to look at this, I began to see, you know, maybe we shouldn't go on vacation, you know. And then I got a sore throat, you know, really bad. I opened my my mouth, you know, and I turned the lights off and I took a little flashlight, looked at my throat and it was all kind of like messed up inside. And I went, ooh, am I dying of cancer? <laughs> it was like, ooh, you know, and all these things are piling up. But I decided to accommodate my wife's vacation by going anyways because she had already taken it and we could postpone it. But, you know, we just decided, no, we'll go and try to tough it out. So I decided to go. We really didn't have the money to spend on going to the doctors and going to this, that, and the other thing. But we had just maybe enough money to get to where we wanted to go. So I, even sick, I got the car packed up with a bunch of junk, you know, and I put some stuff on the roof of the car, you know, and we decided to go and we went and we ran into on the way out a headwind. It was like 60 mile an hour winds, you know, and I've got stuff on top of the roof. Well, we're running the air conditioning full blast too. Our gas mileage sucked. As a matter of fact, we used up over a tank of gas and in then some to get where we were camping. And normally we use maybe a tank of gas, if that. And the prices were just beginning to fall. They hadn't fallen as far as they have now, where I'm recording today, but they were just beginning to fall. So it really cost us a lot of money to get there. Well, behold, we got there, you know, and we kind of had fun and, you know, we kind of, you know, hung out by the river, you know, and did our thing, you know, and then, then we got sunburned really bad, you know. And I was like, well, you know, that's to be expected. But then we started feeling kind of sick, you know. The camping was okay, you know. Things were fine. It wasn't that bad. But then it started getting worse. And it started getting worse. It started getting worse. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh my gosh. We went to town and we uh, took a chance to look at our bank account. <gasps> Overdrawn! Oh no! You know, and about that time, I said, you know, honey, right before we found out we were overdrawn, I said, honey, I think I need to get back. You know, I said, we need to cut this short. And this was about, oh, I don't know, I think Wednesday. And uh, middle of the week of our vacation. And I said, you know, I'm just too sick. I can't really deal with this. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm feverish. I'm, you know, messed up, blah, blah, blah. You know, so anyways, again, accommodations. Well, the bank had made a mistake. Our insurance or agent had made a mistake. People have made mistakes with our bank account. So 
we got on the phone, we started talking to them, started working with them, and things started getting fixed, but they weren't going to get fixed soon enough. So we were out of money. We had no gas. So then I tell my wife, well, if we have to wait till Thursday night, midnight, then that's fine, you know. If, if that's the only way that we can get back, we'll do that, you know. We'll just pack up camp, you know, and pack it all in the car, make sure it's all inside the car and not outside. And, We'll see how well we get gas mileage and, you know, we'll just go home because it just seems like we're in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. So, of course, I'm sicker than a dog and half delirious, you know, and she's kind of like starting to get a little kind of not feeling good. So we decide to go home and we go and we decide to wait for our money to be deposited in the bank, you know, because by that time we would got some information that things were going to get straightened out. But they didn't. And then they got worse. Then they sort of got straightened out, but didn't. You know how that works. Life kind of hits you between the eyes. So then we go and uh, we decide to wait near the gas station so that we can fill up. So we, we camp out overnight, you know, at a rest stop, you know, kind of waiting there till midnight when we could get gas. Midnight rolls around. No deposit. One o'clock rolls around. No deposit. So I call my wife, or I tell my wife, honey, just call the bank and ask for that 800 number and, and just talk to the, whoever the customer service rep is. Maybe they know something about deposits. So sure enough, she calls and we find out, oh, guess what? The bank can deposit it any time after midnight from 12 o'clock till 6 o'clock. Oh, no, Lord. I'm dying, I'm sick, you know, I've been blowing my nose, by this time, you know, my eyes are a mess, my nose is a mess, I'm coughing, I'm choking, I'm just, you know, that kind of disgusting summer cold, summer flu kind of thing, mixture thing, you don't know what it is, whether allergy or flu or cold or whatever, and I haven't been to the doctor, so I have no idea what's going on, and I'm just sicker than a dog, so, of course, we're both trying to survive this now, you know, and she's getting sick, because she's with me, and I'm getting sick, and we're both, like, in the car, and so we decide to move out of the rest stop so we don't bother anybody because this is up like up in Oregon so I go down a, a little kind of access road to the railroad you know and my brother-in-law works for Burlington Northern so I knew nobody would bother us down this road so middle of the night about two o'clock we pull down this road well we just start falling asleep you know from hacking and you know taking all these try and take medications that we don't know if they're working you know and last of it's gone you know and we're taking it and sure enough fall asleep and then bingo a light comes on a police officer, state troopers behind us, and he's got the lights on. So I sit there and I wake up, I go, oh boy. So I roll the window down, I keep my hands on the wheel, and he comes over and starts talking to me, and he says, you know, what are you doing here? And I say, well, believe it or not, we're waiting for our deposit to go in to get gas so that we can go back home. Well, really? What were you doing? Well, we were on vacation, you know, and blah, blah, blah. We got sick, so we decided to head back home. Well, where are you at? Oh, up and, you know, we were told him where and he says well what were you doing there he says oh I used to live over here you know and so we went over there you know we used to you know enjoy camping by the river so we'd been there for you know like four days he says wow you know it's kind of different you know so the, the longer the story kept going the more he began to kind of wind down from his normal like well these are perps you know and he's probably out smoking weed or something or doing weird stuff where we turned out to just be nope two Christians out in the middle of nowhere just doing our thing you know and, so sure enough, <laughs> to make a long story short, he says, okay, well, you know, I don't really care what you're doing on the road. He says, you know, gas station back there. I say, yeah, you know, we're going to go there as soon as the deposit hits, you know. It's, okay, well, you know, have a good night, you know. He left. And so we, we roll the windows back down, you know, decide to pull back to the, the truck stop and pull it, or the rest area, and pull in the rest area and rest there. Finally, about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, it deposit hits. So we get our gas and we head for home. Then we get home. Praise the Lord. We've done it, Lord. I, I promise God, just get us home. And sure enough, when we got home, we were feeling a little bit better, not much. <coughs> we made an appointment for me to get into the doctors that day, which was good. God's beginning to bless us. So I got into my doctors, you know. But also, you know, it was like, man, you know, the gas mileage was phenomenal. We got great gas mileage coming home. So it's like, oh, cool. Everything's beginning to, you know, feel better. We're kind of like, must be hitting in the right direction, doing the right thing. But, of course, sicker than a dog because I got night sweats and chills and fever. And, you know, you've seen some of the videos, sort of, that's kind of like, blech. Well, then we get home. Oh, man. Well, praise the Lord. About every vegetable that we had died. 
tomato plants lived, but just most of the plants died. Almost all the seedlings died. And I said, well, that's all right, you know, at least we were able to accommodate this person so while during the heat of the day when most other people, you know, would turn air conditioning on because she's kind of like same boat we are, you know, the person we had taking care of the plants. She doesn't like to use her monies for electricity, so she doesn't use any air conditioning. But it had been 100 degrees out. And that place where she's living gets really hot. So we told her, come on over to our house and enjoy the, you know, TV and the uh, air conditioning and, you know, just relax. So she did. She came over and she slept in my chair, you know, and, you know, kind of an old beat up chair, but it's comfortable, you know. So she passed out and slept there, you know, and kind of took care of the plants, you know, and, you know, slept and used air conditioning, which is what I wanted. Praise the Lord. But my plants died. So I began to learn, you know, God began to speak to me about, you know, how I had accommodated everyone and how I hadn't really done what God wanted me to do. I was so busy accommodating everyone else's needs as well as my wife and my wife doing that at her job that I kind of got up in that spirit of compromise where, you know, to make other people happy, I was doing all these different things. In other words, not doing what I've always done all my life. Yes, no. Yes, no. And my wife knows this. When we go out, if I feel like something's wrong, I say, honey, we need to go home. And we turn around and go home. And sure enough, something's going on and we are there at the right time. But this time God was showing me what happens when you accommodate other people's needs or desires or wants or specialty items. Well, when I tried to put the house back together, I was so sick that, you know, it was a lot of work trying to get this house back together after I had tore it apart to make it easy for the person to water because we have a lot of plants. Then putting the deck back together was a lot of work. And then getting the computer going again was a lot of work. I mean, it turned out, man, I was working twice as hard and sick to my stomach than I was when I, when I was out on vacation. And sure enough, the one thing I hadn't told you was that while I was out on vacation, God gave me a scripture. I opened up my devotionals and I was reading and he spoke to me and he said, this thing is from me. You will learn and I will give you a miracle. And I was like, well, what's the miracle, Lord? And I kept complaining about that all the way home because <laughs> I was sick. And after going to the doctors, you know, I started taking pills, but I didn't recover very fast. It was real slow and I'm still not recovered. <coughs> Better, but, you know, still got problems with my throat. Now my wife's really sick and she's having problems with her chest and her throat. You know, so it's been a long learning process, but by golly, as I came back from the vacation, I started doing the ministry again. And the ministry skyrocketed. Thousands of people started checking out videos and reading all the different blogs and posts and things that were being on, going on. Matter of fact, today we're breaking a hundred thousand views. Whoa! Wow! So, I realized and recognized that God was using a miracle to show me that while I had been wrong on my timing, the idea was a good idea. The timing was wrong. I had accommodated people instead of doing the timing when the Lord said to do it. And that was my lesson I was learning the hard way. And I'm still a tough, hard lesson I'm learning about this accommodating people. I have to learn not to accommodate, but to do what God tells me to do. Accommodations sound good when you're trying to make other people feel good. But in reality, Jesus at times was very blunt, like with Mary and Martha. Sometimes you can't accommodate other people's wants and desires and needs and feelings when you should be doing something else. And the weird thing was, while I was on vacation, I kept thinking I should be doing something else. So, God taught me. And God may teach you the hard way. He may be using this to explain to you how accommodating someone, if it's going contrary to the will of God, is wrong. No matter how you look at it. You need to stick to the straight and narrow of what God is telling you to do and how God is leading you. Because He's the one who's going to help you even in when you're wrong, doing the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. God was with me and I was suffering and I was sick. I threw up and gagged and all kinds of yucky stuff. But you know, one of the things I found was that I never doubted that God was with me. 
I never had a problem with being and knowing that maybe we did the wrong thing. And I didn't feel like that I was lost or rejected by God. I just felt like I needed to get back to where he wanted me to be. And so I did. Great Bible saints, enraptured lovers of God. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them also that love your name be joyful in you. From Psalms 5.11 Perhaps the most serious charge that can be brought against the modern Christian is that we are not sufficiently in love with Jesus. Love that may rise to a degree of adoration almost beyond the power of the heart to endure. Neither the word adoration nor any of its forms is found in our familiar King James Bible. But the idea there is in full bloom. The great Bible saints were, above all, enraptured lovers of God. They loved Jesus more than anything else in this world or of this world. You know, kind of like some people love their Harleys. The Psalms celebrate the love which David and a few others felt for the person of God. Paul confessed that love for Jesus carried him beyond himself and made him do extravagant things which to a mind untouched with the delights of such love might seem irrational. <coughs> In our Christian circles today, it is rare when we find anyone aglow with personal love for Jesus. I trust it is not uncharitable to say that a great deal of praise in conservative circles is perfunctory and forced or just going along with the crowd where it is not downright sincere. There can be nothing more terrible or more wonderful than to be stricken with love for Jesus so deeply that the whole being goes out in a pained adoration of his person. A a dormant that disturbs and disconcerts while it purges and satisfies and relaxes the deeper inner heart. It's like, oh God, God. This love as a kind of moral fragrance is ever detected upon the garments of the saints and the list of fragrance saints is long. This radiant love for Jesus is to my mind one sure proof of membership in the church universal. The whole point of my accommodation was that I wasn't bringing God into the picture. I really wanted more so to be involved in the ministry and doing what God had given me to do than I wanted to go on vacation and yet I knew my wife needed some time to unwind and so I thought I was doing the right thing. I wasn't. When you love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength then you will have to at times choose to follow that love for him over the love you may have for others. Whether that be your wife, your church, your ministry, your work, your designs, your plans, or even yourself. That's the kind of fervent love, adoring love, the kind of adamant crying out of your soul that A.W. Tozer mentioned once in saying, As a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. We need to be thirsty again for the living God. And we need to fall in love again so that we are seeking Jesus above all else. So we want Jesus more than anything else. So we're talking about Jesus more than we are about everything else. Because if we're not, I question whether we're in love at all. And according to Tozer, we're not. <laughs>